I would like to welcome everyone to the 946th monthly meeting of the Amateur Telescope Makers of Boston. Today's date is November the 11th, 2021, and our guest speaker will be Michael Umbricht, and his talk will be Timekeeping at the Ladd Observatory. Okay, am I on? Oh, yeah. Sorry, I was trying to read the top. It was cut out for me. So the next up is uh, Glenn Chapel. Okay. Uh, good evening. Uh, our cartoon for the month, again, thanks to uh, Julie Kaufman. Uh, shooting style or a billionaire's midlife crisis. So uh, Captain Kirk was up there the last time around. Let's go to the next slide. Sure. Our statement for the month, astronomers like burglars and jazz musicians operate best at night. Uh, Miles Kingston, Miles Kingston, a uh, journalist. And while Rich's picture is up, I did want to pick up again what Corey and Tom have already said. Uh, this was a tragedy. I had a chance to talk to Rich very briefly the other day. And those grandchildren of his, uh, they're one and a half, three and a half, and a little over five. That's tragic, especially with Christmas, the holidays coming up as well. And they mentioned the uh, GoFundMe page. And I wanted to thank Bruce Berger. He put something out about a month ago to announce that the, the GoFundMe page. And uh, Tom gave out an address earlier. I checked out something today. And if anybody is interested, I mean, they can always contact me. Be glad to send uh, the address. Uh, there's a very short one. It's basically www.gofundme.com. And then there's a slash and F. And then just help slash the uh, dash, rather, the dash Nugent dash family. You don't need all that extra stuff there. I also just Googled help the Nugent family. And uh, I was able to get it as well, but please uh, look that over and, and uh, be generous. It's been a tough time for all of them. Uh, we'll go on with the observing committee report. Uh, again, we have the moon passing a, a couple of planets, which is always good for some of you newcomers if you're not sure just exactly where to find something. Right now, as we speak, above uh, a half a mile thick cloud band, uh, Jupiter is above the first quarter moon, so we're going to miss that one tonight. Uh, on Wednesday, the 17th, in the early morning, there'll be the neat Leonid meteor shower. Again, it's not as pr uh, prolific as it was back in those uh, really uh, large years, back around the turn of the century. Uh, you might see about 10 to 12, but again, the, the moon's going to be a gibbous phase, so it's going to be in the way that particular night. But if you happen to be up anyway and can't sleep, you might go outside and see what you can spot. We have a, a deep partial lunar eclipse coming up on Friday the 19th. This will be basically an after midnight. It'll be a morning type of event. And uh, the moon will be almost completely covered by the, 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 the uh, umber shadow. So it will be an interesting event. It won't be like a lot of these partial eclipses where just the penumbra touches the moon. The moon looks a little bit shaded. This will be a pretty dark event. Uh, on the Tuesday, November 23rd, between 6.52 and 9.39, so right after supper time, there'll be a double shadow transit on Jupiter. And this will be the outer moons, Ganymede and Callisto. So for three hours, both those shadows will be uh, visible on the moon. On December 6th, after sunset, Venus will pair up with a thin crescent moon, very thin crescent moon, by the way, low in the evening sky. And after sunset the next night, Saturn will appear above the, the uh, crescent moon. I think it'll be about a four day old moon. Then I think it's about a three day old moon for uh, the pair up with Venus. So you'd have to have an open uh, sky over to the south, uh, southwest. Uh, next slide. Our challenge, uh, our challenge for this particular, this, okay, we got this in. I didn't know that slide was put in. Rich must have put this in, but there are the events right there, the times and everything. Next slide. Thanks, Kelly. The observer's challenge for November 2021 is NGC 7662, also known as the Blue Snowball. And I put in two charts. The one over to the right is the whole constellation Andromeda. And there's a group up near the top. And uh, right now, I think Corey is pointing it out. There's Psi, Lambda, Kappa, and Iota. It's a Y-shaped group. And that's known as uh, Frederick's Glory. It's an asterism. And that's where I keyed in on first. You go down to Iota. And uh, you can swing across the 16. And on the chart over on the left there, that's from the AAVSO. The 4.1 magnitude star is Kappa. The 4.3 magnitude star is Iota. And you can see uh, 13. It's not, it's labeled, it's not labeled rather, but it's right there. And I moved about uh, two degrees uh, kind of westward, a little bit dropped west, south a little bit from uh, 
iota to get to 13. And then I just used the medium power eyepiece and I was able to pick up NGC 7662. It's very star-like under low power, but it's very noticeable, very easy to find. And by the way, I used that same chart over there on the left to look for that uh, planetary nebula with binoculars. And, you know, this is a ch observer's challenge and it really isn't much of a challenge as far as being able to see it. I've, I've seen it with a uh, 60 millimeter refracting telescope, but I wanted to see if I could pick it up with binoculars. And I was surprised, it was relatively easy. Uh, I saw two magnitudes for this object. One was 8.3 and some sources said 8.6. I would tend to lead toward 8.3 because it's fairly easy to see with my uh, 10 by 50 binoculars. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. I think we have some pictures of this. Uh, the one on the, the left was uh, was taken by Doug Paul. And the one on the right, of course, is from Mario Mata. And the color, very deep here, very noticeable. That's another thing. Uh, I wasn't able to detect any color. I, I should go back, by the way. With binoculars, I definitely couldn't see the nebula. I just saw what looked like a star. There was just, the only way I knew it was what it was was because it was the exact location that my chart said. But uh, to see this thing, you need, uh, I'd say at least a magnifying power, about 60 to 75 power in that area to really see that you've got that disc. The disc, by the way, is said to be about 37 arc seconds across, but I think that's the outer part. And it looks like in Mario's picture on the right, you can see an outer area there. Uh, the inner part is probably half that size. So it's, it, again, it's a small object. You want to use some high magnification. With a four and a half inch telescope, I'll be honest, I wasn't sure I could see the color. And there is some question sometimes. I know in my case, knowing it's called the blue snowball, there could have been a bias. I thought I could see a very faint bluish tinge, but again, it could have been a bias. I did check it out with my 10 inch telescope the other day and it was definitely bluish, but it was a pale blue. And uh, it's Leland, Leland Copeland. He wrote the uh, Deep Sky Wonders column before Walter Scott Houston picked it up in 1946. And he's the one that came up with the term. He said it looked like a light blue snowball. And I would think that's be more uh, descriptive what it looks like. It's kind of a light blue, at least to me in my small telescope and the, the 10 inch scope. And again, uh, I want you to encourage you all to look up and please uh, be generous to Rich's family. It's been a tough time for all of them with the holidays coming up. So I thank those of you who've already gotten involved with this and uh, we'll keep him in our thoughts. Thank you, keep looking up. Thank you. Thank you. So if there are no more new business, uh, then we can move on to the, the guest speaker tonight is Michael Umbricht from, uh, he's a curator of the Brown University's historic LAD Observatory. The observatory opened in 1891 and is part of the Department of Physics at Brown University. Today it's operated as a working museum where visitors can experience astronomy as it was practiced a century ago. Mike spends most of his time presenting science outreach and public education programs, demonstrations, and exhibits. He's also responsible for the Historic Scientific Instrument Collection. Mike's primary research interest is in late 19th and early 20th century astronomy with a focus on precision timekeeping using mechanical clocks and transit telescopes. Other research inc includes the early history of wireless and the industrialization of Providence. He has been with Brown since 2004 and before that, Mike was a coordinator for the Providence Planetarium and the Museum of Natural History in Roger Williams Park. So very pleased to hand it over to Michael. I think we should be able to take it or maybe I have to stop. Uh, yep, I think I'm all set. Okay. So I'm very happy to be here and uh, I'm going to be talking about the LAD Observatory, which when it opened, one of the main goals was to have a state-of-the-art observatory for training students. Uh, being at sea level near Narragansett Bay, uh, not very conducive to research. Uh, the second activity at LAD was precision timekeeping. So calibrating mechanical clocks, pendulum clocks, uh, by star observations. And that's the main focus of my talk tonight. Uh, this particular image that you're looking at is really fascinating to me. You'll notice that there's a clock 
and it has a tube that connects to the side of the hat. Just underneath uh, the hat is the observer's ear. And what I suspect is happening, the book that I scanned this from makes no mention of what it uh, entails. Uh, but I suspect that the astronomer would glance at the dial of the clock to read the time and then start listening to the ticks, which would be transmitted through the tube to his ear. And he would count off the seconds and wait for a star to pass in front of the telescope as the Earth rotates. And so this was a very early method of timekeeping, a crude one, um, but it was probably pretty effective. Our story of observatories being used for timekeeping begins with a train crash, one of many. In the second half of the 1800s, it was very common for trains to collide. Uh, the reason for this is that the railroads were growing rapidly. Uh, between a city like Providence and another one like Worcester, you would often have just one train track and you would have both uh, northbound and southbound trains traveling on this single track. The way that they avoided collisions was there would be a side spur uh, where one train would arrive and pull over onto a second track that was just long enough for the train, wait for the other train to pass, and then get back onto the main line. This required very accurate timekeeping. Um, the trains had to leave the station at an exact time and arrive at the, the spur at the correct time uh, to avoid collisions. Uh, this particular train crash was in Valley Falls um, in Rhode Island, just a little bit north of Providence. And at this location, there was a bend in the tracks with very steep rocks on either side of it, making it difficult to see what was ahead. And apparently the trains arrived at the incorrect time. Uh, this is from the New York Times. Uh, these train cars that carried the passengers were made of wood. And when the two locomotives would collide, the second car carrying passengers would then collapse into the back of the locomotive. The third car would collapse into that. Uh, the single train crash, there were 40 dead, uh, excuse me, 14 people died and 40 were seriously injured. Uh, you'll notice at the bottom it says, the latter train was out of time. Um, this meant that their chronometers, their watches, were not correct. And again, in this article, it also says the variation of a timepiece is assigned as the immediate occasion of the meeting. And the word timepiece is emphasized here. Uh, you may have seen old movies where they show a train conductor who reaches into a pocket and pulls out a watch checks the time. This was not some uh, casual thing that they were doing. It was a very precise ritual that was instituted by the train companies to keep the trains running on time so that they would not collide. Uh, a little bit later, this is 1853, uh, the railroads came up with another method, which was time zones. Uh, very often, Providence and Boston are at slightly different longitudes. And so a star will transit the meridian at a slightly different time and there'll be a couple of minutes off. And so all of the clocks in one city would be set a few minutes different from another city. And this caused a lot of confusion. The people injured on these trains uh, experienced symptoms like nightmares and um, trembling hands. At the time, it was diagnosed using an archaic medical term called railway spine. It was believed that the force of the impact caused damage to the nerves, but these were too small to be seen in a microscope. Um, later, it was realized that this was an early example of post-traumatic stress disorder in civilians. In this article here, um, it says that the Camden and Amboy, which runs roughly from New York City to Philadelphia, uh, had happened just a short time earlier. There were numerous uh, train crashes and the government threatened regulations that the railroad companies didn't want to institute. And so this timekeeping system uh, was their solution of an industry standard. It wasn't until about World War I when um, 
the federal government intervened in standard time zones. It was originally an industry standard. This is about 40 years before Lad Observatory opened. And by the time the observatory was finished in 1891, uh, it doesn't appear that they really provided time signals to the railroads. By that time, most of the railroads had already picked a vendor like Western Union, uh, which provided accurate time. Um, but in Rhode Island, we have the height of the Industrial Revolution. This is when people are punching time cards, which had to be accurately set. Um, the observatory also intended to provide time signals to courthouses, city hall, um, and other locations, in particular jewelers who would calibrate clocks. Uh, this is view of an observer using the 12 inch refractor, um, which was made, the lens is John Brashear, uh, the mount is Sage Mueller. And here's an exterior view showing the slit of the dome open, uh, looking from the southeast. You'll we'll notice that the left hand part of the building is made of brick, and then there's an extension on the right which is made of wood. And that extension is called, um, we call it the transit room. It has a flat roof. Um, there are some interesting features. If you look at those windows, they're what we call pocket windows. The window sill just beneath the window is removable. And beneath that, there's a slot in the wall and you can slide the windows right down into that slot. On the top of the roof, there are hatches which are hinged. Um, an observer would go to one of the corners of the room, turn a ship's wheel like you would use to steer the rudder of a sailing ship. This is connected by ropes and counterweights to an axle on the ceiling, and this would flip open the hatches to open it up. And so you would have a nearly 180 degree view of the sky from the two observing stations that are in the transit room. Here's a floor plan of the building, uh, which is mirror image of what I just showed you in the photograph. Uh, the entrance is on the right. Uh, room 100 is the foyer. 101 uh, has this sideways U-shaped feature. Uh, this is the pier that supports the equatorial refractor. And you'll notice that there's an opening on the left-hand side uh, with double doors and a small room is embedded in the center of the pier. Uh, this is called the clock vault, which I'll be talking about extensively. If you continue down the corridor 100A and B to the left-hand side, uh, we have the transit room over here. And uh, this is where the timekeeping observations were made. Here's a view from that corridor looking down into the transit room and you can see two piers with telescopes mounted on them. Uh, these piers were constructed first and then the floor was built around it with an air gap. So no vibrations from equipment being moved around on the floor will disturb the telescopes. The first pier that you see in the front was for training students. It has a small pier that's about uh, two feet uh, square. And the far pier is the one used for scientific observations. It's shaped like a gigantic pyramid, which is about um, eight feet at its base. Looking in the opposite direction, uh, we see a view into the clock vault and you can see a pendulum with a dial above it. And here's a view of the Meridian instrument, the, the so-called transit telescope. Um, it has a very precise axis for aligning along the meridian from north to south. And this can be used to measure time once you know the latitude and longitude of the observatory. You can also see the ship's wheel to the right of it with the rope that I was describing that is used to open up the hatches above it. This view is looking from the north of the observatory. Um, when that telescope that I just showed you in the last slide was installed, it apparently didn't work very well. And so they sent it back to the manufacturer um, to have it fixed. In the meantime, a second observing shed was built, um, which you see here on the right. And this one has a roll off roof with a very small 
transit instrument in it. This was used for teaching while the uh, main instrument for scientific work was being repaired. And here's the telescope. Uh, they ended up not repairing the first one. They, they built the second one. This is the one that we still have at the observatory today. If you look closely over here, there's a small box. This is a marine chronometer, a very precise timekeeping device that's basically used as a portable stopwatch or um, uh, if you're doing observations in the field. On the side of the telescope, there's a small lamp with an electric wire that connects to a battery. It shines light um, into the side of the telescope, which reflects off the mirror and backlights or illuminates the, the reticle, the uh, crosshairs. Uh, I'm not going to get too much into this because I assume that most of you are at least a little bit familiar with the astronomical coordinates. Uh, but here we see a star map that shows right ascension at the top from uh, 14 to 24 and uh, declination on the right from plus 60 to the celestial equator. Uh, the main point of this slide is just to show that a particular slide like this one in Pegasus is the 23 hours sidereal time star. And when you see this pass through the cross threads on a transit telescope, you know that that's the correct time. And so this is the basic basis of getting from the Earth's rotation to the correct time on the pendulum. And of course, we're measuring sidereal time here. So it's three minutes and 56 seconds shorter than a 24 hour day due to the Earth's movement around the sun. When you look through a transit telescope, there's a single horizontal line and five vertical lines. And so you would line up a star in the horizontal line and wait for the star to move across the field of view and move behind each one of these vertical pieces. You would then tap a telegraph key when you saw the star wink out. And this would send a signal to a chart recorder called a chronograph, and it would record the exact time of the observation. I'll talk more about this in a moment. These threads have to be incredibly thin. If you were to use something as thick as a human hair, it would cause the star to be blocked for too long. So instead, what they used was spiderweb threads. The spiderweb threads that are uh, circular are very sticky, but not very strong. The ones that radiate out from the center are strong, but not sticky. And so an astronomer would keep a spider in their office, feed it insects occasionally. Uh, and then you would take a pencil and lift the spider out of the container and bump it off the pencil. The spider would then attach its web to the pencil. And as it falls, you would turn the pencil to harvest the spiderweb threads, and it would wrap around the pencil. Afterwards, you would then use a microscope or a magnifying glass. You would pull off a, smart, uh, a small section of the spiderweb thread and then uh, glue it very carefully into the eyepiece holder. I've actually done this. It's a lot harder than it sounds. I mentioned that when you look through the telescope, you tap a telegraph key, which sends a signal. Uh, this is the switchboard or control center of our telegraph. By flipping various switches on the wall, we can send time signals from a particular clock to the chart recorder or from the telegraph key to the chart recorder. And here we see some chronometers that are being uh, portable chronometers that are being calibrated. In the center here, there are also some relays. Um, different voltages are used when you send a telegraph signal inside of a building, as opposed to sending one a long distance, uh, miles away from another building. And these telegraph um, relays are used to sort of amplify and repeat the signals. The observatory was built in 1891, which is about a decade or so before there was electricity in the neighborhood. So in order to operate the battery of uh, the telegraph, we would have to 
to use batteries. Uh, each one of these batteries that you see here produces one volt and so six volts total. You'll notice that it has a little bit of a bluish color. This is called blue vitriol or copper sulfate. Uh, there's a copper electrode in the top and a um, zinc electrode in the bottom. And this generates the, the potential voltage. As the battery starts to uh, wear down and before it goes dead, it goes from a, a deep like Maxfield Parrish blue color into one that's very pale. So you can visually tell when the battery is starting to get um, depleted and just mix some more crystals of copper sulfate into it to recharge and replenish the batteries. This is a um, chronograph made by Warner and Swayze. Uh, this particular one, uh, you can see at the bottom there are weights. You wind it up like a clock. Again, we don't have enough electricity to operate our mechanical uh, devices. And the telegraph wires connect here to an electromagnet, which is attached to a pen. One pair of wires goes to a clock. And so every time the pendulum swings, the pen will make a movement and make a mark on the paper once a second. The other pair of wires goes to the telegraph key that records the astronomer's observations. The drum rotates once a minute. And so at the end of the night, you can take the piece of paper off and use a ruler to measure the distance between the marks made by the astronomer and the clock's tick marks and see how far the clock is off. Here's one of our clocks. Uh, this one was set to sidereal time. Uh, you'll notice that the entire thing is in a glass cylinder with a bell jar on the top of it. And on the right-hand side, there's a bicycle pump. And what you do is you pump the air out of the sealed vacuum chamber, and this lowers the pressure inside. Um, I mentioned the clock ball, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Uh, the clock vaults has brick walls that are about two feet thick. And this acts as thermal insulation to prevent temperature changes in the building from affecting the pendulums. If the temperature of the pendulum goes up, the metal will expand and get longer. And this changes the rate at which the pendulum swings. So you want to try to keep the environment as constant as possible. The mass of the pier also that the um, clock is bolted to, also dampens vibrations that might be caused by a train or trucks going by on the street. Controlling the pressure adds another layer of both thermal insulation and keeping the pressure constant, which can affect the pendulum. This clock was made by the uh, firm of Clemens Riefler in Munich, Germany. These are often called astronomical regulators. Uh, these are the most precise mechanical clocks of their time, sort of the uh, race cars or the, um, you know, the highest performance that you can get. This is a more ordinary pendulum clock, but of higher quality than an ordinary one. Uh, it's certainly not the typical kind of grandfather clock that a family would have in their parlor. Um, inside the clock, behind the, the dial of it, there is a mechanism called a brake mechanism or brake circuit. Each time the pendulum swings, it opens a switch that lets the telegraph pulse go through the wire. And so that's how we can get the signals off of the clock to calibrate it. So by 1893, just about two years after the observatory opened, there were hundreds of um, clocks around the city of Providence and nearby cities like Pawtucket that were all calibrated uh, to the Lad Observatory. And um, we also had a company called Rhode Island Electric Protective Company. They were a burglar company. They ran wires from their main office in downtown Providence to the various jewelers. And this was a burglar alarm at night. In the daytime, when the jeweler would turn off the burglar alarm, the protective company would then transmit time signals from us to 
the jewelers so they, they could make adjustments to the clocks and make sure that they were incredibly accurate. We had a second telegraph wire that ran to City Hall where the fire marshal had an office. And from there, the signals were distributed throughout the city. So at noon and 8.30 every single day, the horns, bells, or whatever audible uh, signal was in a particular neighborhood fire station would go off at exactly the same time every day. And people in the neighborhood could then check their clocks, see that it's running a minute fast and make an adjustment to it. I should also um, back up a second and point out this entire system predates uh, the invention of radio. Um, the only way to really send time signals for a significant distance was to use a landline telegraph wire. And Providence was quite proud of the fact that we weren't reliant on other uh, cities for our time signals. It was very inconvenient when a blizzard or a hurricane would knock down the telegraph signals and then it might take days or even weeks to repair those wires. Before Lad Observatory opened, um, Providence would get time signals from Cambridge, the Harvard College Observatory, uh, New Haven, the Yale Observatory, and Washington, the US Naval Observatory. Time is money and we sold it. Um, we earned an income of about $200 per year from selling time signals, which may not sound like a lot, but if you take into account inflation, that's about $2,000 a year, uh, which would have been the salary of a staff person at Flat Observatory. So this offsets some of the costs of operating the observatory and to some extent subsidized um, the observatory's operation. So we have this precision timekeeping system, which is used for uh, stamping documents at courts and time cards. Uh, that doesn't need to be very accurate. Uh, the system itself, though, was accurate to about one one hundredth of a second. And believe it or not, that's more accurate than the cell phone in your pocket, which would very often be off by a second or two. We also use these precision time signals for uh, scientific experiments. I don't know if you can tell in this photo because it's a little um, hard to see, but there's one, two, three, four pendulums, which are connected to these four dials at the bottom. So each of these four dials tells you the individual pendulum's rate. Behind the dials, there are gearing mechanisms. And so the pair on the left, you would take an average of the two, then you would take an average of the two on the right, and then another mechanism would take the average of the two pairs, which would be the final time uh, displayed on the main dial. Uh, this was invented by Hezekiah Conan. Uh, he was a prominent um, owner of a mill in Pawtucket. He designed his own machinery for the mill and he had access to a machine shop and talented craftsmen. His hobby was designing uh, precision clocks. This particular one didn't work out that well. Uh, it turns out that vibrations transmitted from the pendulums through the wood of the clock sort of interfered with them operating the way as, uh, that they were intended. So here we have uh, <clears throat> 1905. Comparison of Washington and Lad Observatory times. Uh, the purpose of this particular experiment was to calculate the exact difference in the clocks between DC and Providence to measure the exact longitude difference between the two. You'll notice that it says that uh, they had the use of the long distance line operated by American Telephone and Telegraph. AT&T. Uh, during the daytime, this would have been a very expensive service because uh, it was not very common and businesses would have paid a large amount of money to transmit messages. At night, not so much business is being conducted. And so they donated the use of this expensive communications line uh, for the purpose of conducting the scientific 
experiment. And uh, according to the text here, they were a little worried that it would be cloudy, but it did end up being clear enough that they were able to uh, make the observations at both locations. And this is what the chronograph chart recorder looks like. Uh, the top part, each one of the horizontal lines is one minute. And you'll see that there are two series of tick marks. There's one that's perfectly vertical and a second that is diagonal from uh, the left to the lower right. Uh, the ones up here are just test signals. One of these is um, a mean solar time clock, which is the one at Washington, DC. The other is a sidereal clock, the Riefler in Providence. And because the Riefler is running a little fast, it catches up with the solar clock. By using two clocks running at different rates, uh, this is similar to the way that a musician tunes a guitar. You would pluck two strings and then listen to the beat frequency in between them. And this is more accurate than just listening to a single string. Um, by calculating exactly which minute the two coincide, and then when they coincide again, you get a much more accurate reading. Uh, notice that they're receiving signals exactly 0.07 seconds late. So that's the, uh, the offset between um, the accuracy of the uh, measurements. And uh, this is a second experiment that took place a little bit later, 1913. Uh, this is pre-World War One. Radio is still extremely experimental and very few people are practicing the art of building and um, operating radios. Uh, there's a Mr. Donnelly's house. Apparently, Professor Winslow Upton, the astronomer, uh, went to a neighbor's house and uh, the neighbor had a radio that was able to receive time signals from the US Naval Observatory. Now, in Paris, the Eiffel Tower was used to transmit time signals from the Paris Observatory across the Atlantic. These are some of the first transatlantic transmissions that were successfully received. The Naval Observatory, in turn, would compare their clocks to Paris and then retransmit signals to um, people in smaller cities like Providence. The Eiffel Tower itself was not used as the transmitting antenna. Instead, it was used as a mast from which wires were strung. And so there's a small building near the Eiffel Tower, which has wires that run up to these aerials, which are used to transmit the powerful signals across the ocean. And you can see the operator here um, operating the equipment. Here's another view of Lad Observatory from the east. Here's the transit room. Um, around this time, we constructed another observatory here, uh, this wooden transit observing shed. Uh, there's five different stations where you can make observations. You can see the other roll-off roof one uh, behind it. This one has a flat roof with patches that open. I was looking closely at this photo, which we scanned at very high resolution, and I noticed this thin line. So I did a little bit of uh, digital forensics and zoomed in on it. And what I discovered is a radio antenna on a neighbor's house. Uh, this is Mr. Donnelly's house. And this is an inverted V, which was used to receive the signals from Washington, DC. At the time, Donnelly was an amateur, he would sell kits or radios that he built in his garage, uh, very young. I think he was about 20 years old at the time that he did this. And he helped uh, in this experiment for an astronomer at Brown. Uh, very early example of uh, citizen science collaborating with professional astronomers. And so here's his uh, call sign. Uh, just as stations today have call signs like WBZ, 
Uh, this is 1UD, Harold Donnelly, who lived on Observatory Ave. These are the uh, transmitting towers at the Naval Observatory's um, Naval Station at Arlington, Virginia. Um, unfortunately, Professor Winslow Upton passed away before he could finish uh, reducing the data uh, and it was left to others to finish the work. Uh, the observatory just opened for the first time in a year and a half this past Tuesday. Uh, we do have some restrictions on access to the building. Masks are required. Uh, you have to go to Eventbrite and uh, reserve a ticket. And if you'd like to know more, you can go to blogs.brown.edu. Uh, in particular, um, if you go to category timekeeping. I have uh, some other work that I've written about that I didn't talk about in this presentation, including the time ball in Boston that you see here. And that's all I have. Thank you for uh, listening tonight. Thank you, Michael. That was really cool. Tons and tons of new things I never knew about. It's always fascinating. Especially all the 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 ways that they make things work without electricity to make do and mechanical and make your own batteries and it's crazy. Yeah, if you visit the observatory, our um, our dome is of course on roller bearings, but there's a giant wheel and a rope pulley that you have to turn to open the slit. You have to pull another rope. Um, the actual uh, clock drive that drives the refractor is a mechanical clock that we have to wind up at the beginning of each night. And as the weights slowly fall on the mount of the, um, the base of the telescope, it drives a governor, which regulates the speed, and that connects to the main gear on the telescope. And that has not changed since 1891. We still, we teach That's students fantastic. on how to operate telescopes like it was 1891. <laughs> So I, I just want to, I, I just want to remind everyone, uh, if you have a question, we can we'll try to use the, the raise hand uh, function built into WebEx. So down in the bottom will be reactions. It's like a smiley face with a plus. If you click on that, there'll be a raise hand button. So I've raised my hand and it, it brings my, it snaps my video up to the front. So we'll, we'll be able to see that you have a question and you'll have a chance to speak. Yeah, anything you'd like to know more about? I, I just, uh, you had mentioned that the telegraph could take weeks to repair. Mm. I imagine a telephone pole wasn't all too common back in those days to, yeah, to, to and, repair the system and long drawn copper wire. And for a large storm, you might have multiple breaks along a long line from, say, Providence to Boston. And even more breaks if it's going from Providence to Washington, D.C. So, yeah, you'd have to send out crews along perhaps 50 to a couple of hundred miles. And it was a lot more reliable uh, to have the signal generated locally and, you know, you could have more control over it then. Another thing I didn't mention is um, I talked briefly about those relays that were used as repeaters. That's one of the things that slows down the time signal significantly because you have an electromagnet pulling a um, piece of metal down to touch something. And that takes more than a hundredth of a second. So that introduces delays in when the time signals arrive. I was wondering about that. Yeah, actually, while I'm on the subject, if you look above my shoulder over here, there's a clock on the wall. Uh, I borrowed that from the lab observatory. That's one of the auxiliary dials. So that would have been in a business or uh, a government building. And it has a clock movement on the inside, but there's no power source. Instead, a, a pulse of electricity through a telegraph line would provide both the power to move the hand of the clock and the precise synchronization where once a minute, it would snap the minute hand to the correct position. 
Is that in any way related to like institutional clocks? I know at my school, they had a centralized time system where all the clocks yeah. were so coordinated. In, um, in something like a large school or a factory, yes, they, they probably would have had a master clock somewhere in the building. Um, if you go to Providence, there's the very large state house, which is used today. But there's also another historic building uh, which is the old state house that predates 1890s. And they had a system in there where each one of the rooms in the state house had an auxiliary dial like this. And then in the main office, they had a main clock that would synchronize everything inside the building. And presumably the clock in the main office would go to someplace like Lad Observatory to get their, their source time. I see a, a hands up from Thomas. Or I think uh, okay. Gerald's first in line. Oh. Hi, uh, just, just a comment that it, when we talk about the relay uh, delays, there is a way to compensate for that, which is that since most of these telegraph lines were two directional, okay, you could measure the round trip, okay, of a, uh, of a signal, and that would comp give you the compensation that you need. Okay. And that was actually used. Yeah, I've not seen any mention of that in any of the documents about our system. Uh, it may have been used elsewhere, but uh, it doesn't look like it was used in Providence. Well, thanks. Thanks, Michael. This is Tom uh, for a fascinating talk. I'm intrigued by the societal impacts that this type of, of uh, technology in imbibed upon us and we can curse it also you know curt time in general is been our enemy but I, i'm fascinated by the idea of uh the timekeepers at factories and sweatshops and you know sweater mills and those types of things so if you can comment a little bit more on that in terms of timekeeping and you mentioned people clocking their times in yeah, and you could how write. precise so yeah. cook the clocks and get your workers to work an extra 10 minutes each day yeah absolutely yeah so in the early half of the 1800s um rhode island in particular was mostly agrarian with a little bit of industry like slater mill for example but by the time you get into the 1850s 1860s uh providence is growing rapidly uh factories are opening some of the largest in the world um, and for a factory to run smoothly, you need shifts and timekeeping. Um, the accuracy of the, the clocks used for a time card, it only needed to be good to within less than a minute or several seconds. Um, but you want to make sure that the whistles, for example, would blow at exactly 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. or whatever time the workers started. Um, Many of the mill owners were very religious and they also saw punctuality as being sort of a virtue. And by regulating time exactly, they saw it as improving the morals of their employees. Um, so there, there's, there's a lot of different aspects to it, not just practical. Um, in some cities, uh, Boston included, Newport, uh, they had a time ball where uh, ship's captains would regulate those small portable marine chronometers before they set sail. Uh, Providence, as far as I can tell, never had one. We just had the, uh, the fire department uh, bells and whistles that would go off. And one thing to keep in mind is that uh, clocks were very inaccurate. If you had a pendulum clock in your home, there's going to be pretty large temperature swings. Uh, I talked about the thermal expansion of a metal pendulum, but many pendulums were made of wood. Instead of thermal expansion, they absorb humidity. So in the summer, when it's very humid, uh, they would expand and swell. The pendulum would get longer, and that would affect the rate. Um, and then if you're heating your home, uh, the air would be very dry in the winter, and the pendulum would contract. And there's also... Uh, uh, hysteresis is the te technical term. There's there's a time delay between when the room environment changes and the pendulum changes. Um, a metal pendulum is going to be 
a relatively short time between a room temperature change and the pendulum expanding or contracting. For humidity, it takes a little bit longer. Fascinating, thank you. Ken, do you have a question? Uh, more of a comment. Um, I was just gonna say, for those who haven't been to LAD, you really need to go. Um, it is the ideal um, vision of a 19th century observatory. I've been to many programs there and uh, they use the original equipment like um, slide projectors with uh, lantern slide projectors, <clears throat> excuse me, with uh, the various slides where they turn a crank and you can see the planets revolving around the sun and eclipse simulators and things like that. Uh, so it, it has been a magical place at night, you know, when it's, uh, it, it can be, you know, even on inclement weather, they would do that. And I don't, I'm not sure with the pandemic what, what is happening or will be happening at least near term. But um, I, I do have a couple memories uh, that are uh, fond memories. Some of you in the club know John Briggs, and um, he grew up near Lad Observatory and was there uh, quite frequently. And uh, <clears throat> on the centennial um, event or this uh, celebration they had at LAD uh, celebrating the 100th anniversary, so I guess this would be 1991, so I'm dating myself a bit, um, John was one of the invited speakers. And I remember uh, those who are familiar with local politics and everything, um, uh, Providence had a rather um, um, colorful, mayor at the time, um, who I think wasn't, hadn't gone to jail maybe for the second time yet. But in any case, uh, Buddy Cianci was, I had no idea what he looked like, but when he walked into the observatory, I thought that's a politician, you could just tell. <laughs> and uh, so that was a, um, you know, an, an interesting memory to be sure. And uh, I was also gonna, when, uh, when you mentioned about, um, Spider webs, and mm. uh, I have um, re, you know, replaced um, spider webs on transit instruments and things like that. And um, you can, in fact, purchase. And uh, if you're patient and um, and check eBay frequently, which is the source of all things in the known universe, eventually um, you can buy uh, spider silk, mm. and it's sold by the meter and um, here, uh, let's see, not sure if that's or not. Mm -hmm. But um, Central, Central Scientific um, sold it and it came from a guy in, um, at Case, um, Case uh, School of Applied Science in Cleveland. And uh, the, what they did, and I'm not sure if this is mm -hmm. gonna be very clear, but basically there is what's called a loom. And so they get, a garden spider, and they get it to start dropping, and uh, and then they just keep up with this thing, and the spider is hanging from it. But as he tries to get lower down and keeps letting out more and more silk, he's not making any progress, and uh, they're just winding up, uh, you know, reel after reel, essentially, of uh, spider web. And um, so I have used these and. Um, and it's good that they have a lot of tries at it because it is surprisingly difficult to get to both catch it with your uh, tweezers, two pairs of tweezers, put a drop of um, adhesive on one and stretch it and get it to wind up in the right spot. And particularly as he described, you have six, six vertical wires and they're basically about a millimeter apart. So it, it's, um, it's tricky, and I was I wound up needing to get a second box of this because um, the ones I got um, it's so fragile and delicate that um, that they break, and uh, and even ones you buy that are supposedly new, since these are fifty years old or more, um, things happen, um, and uh, you don't have as many suitable ones left. I think this one only has one one strand left and the other one I have has more. But um, it is, it, it's, it's quite an art and you really can appreciate, um, 
you know, just how difficult um, trying to redo things that earlier people do really gives you an appreciation for some of the things that they encountered doing it. It gives you more appreciation for the skill. Um, so anyway, I just want to say that, but I, I enjoyed your talk and uh, I heartily encourage people to, um, to visit LAD. They do have a weekly, um, weekly newsletter that you can sign up for that gives, all, gives a lot of information about what's up in the sky and what you can look for and um, various things about the season and everything. So um, that's something you can also do. So thank you for, um, I guess I would say coming, except for yeah. in this case, it's, uh, it's an electronic trip, but thanks for coming. Yeah, and I hope to get up uh, to visit one of your in-person meetings. Uh, on the topic of spider webs, I came across in my research, there was one astronomer who insisted that the best spider web threads came from black widows. And he kept the black widow in his office, which freaked out his colleagues. <laughs> the method of, uh, with the loom that you were describing, that was used up until uh, through World War II not for astronomy telescopes, but for rifle sites. And they used it in uh, weapons uh, for the crosshead uh, hairs. Uh, it wasn't until the invention of nylon where they were able to take molten nylon and stretch it thin enough that it approached the thickness of a spider web thread. Um, so- Michael, what kind of dimensions are you talking about? In terms oh, of I, I can't remember. And it really depends on the species too. Um, yeah. Some spiders actually produce thinner or thicker webs. I don't remember the exact dimensions, but it's much even thinner. In, than even individual there. spiders often, uh, like garden spiders, have different diameter. They have construction webs, which is sort of the reinforcing ones that are thicker. Mm -hmm. And then they fill in between to catch the bugs and everything with a much right. finer thing. And okay. th this particular... And Central Scientific one says it was obtained from the golden garden spider. Mm -hmm. So not That's the, okay. not the uh, black widow. Human hair is around five thou ish. Yeah, three to five, yeah. Much thinner than that. Oh, much, yeah. You know, it's um, 15 microns or 10 microns. You know, it's under a thousandth of an inch. Uh, the tensile strength is amazing for spider webs yeah. threads. Um, I also have uh, one thing that I forgot to put in my bio when I sent it. Um, I'm, it said that I worked at the planetarium in the park in Providence, which was part of the city. So I was a city employee. Um, Buddy Cianci was my boss. And I was the only astronomer on the payroll. So I can actually claim to be the official court astronomer for Cianci. <laughs> If you're, if you're not yeah. from the if the Providence area, you have no appreciation for this whatsoever. Yeah, I CNC am. was tried on corruption charges, including racketeering influence, running City Hall as a racketeering influence corrupt organization. And uh, one final thing, you at the start, um, you mentioned that LAD is preserved and operated the way that it was 130 years ago. Uh, there are very few observatories in the United States that are still operated that way. LAD lucked out because of benign neglect. In about the 1920s, um, timekeeping by star was starting to get obsolete. The, the Naval Observatory was transmitting time signals via radio. And the astronomer, uh, Professor Charles Smiley, was interested in eclipses. So instead of using LAD for his research, he would travel to other parts of the world to do solar eclipses. As a consequence, they never removed the mechanical clock drive or motorized anything in the building, as they did at just about every other single observatory from that era across the country. The only observatory I'm aware of in the US that is preserved and restored as, as well as LED is, is the one in Cincinnati. Hmm. So it's, it, it's a really unique resource in that um, you really do experience astronomy the way that it was practiced in a very early era.
Yeah. Looking looking at Saturn through the Cincinnati telescope was my first experience in astronomy. So mm -hmm. that was an, an amazing, I think it's a 14 inch refractor there. So um, it's, it's big. It's it was 11, big, the biggest one. Yeah, 11. Yeah. Okay. It was impressive. Yeah. And the, um, um, Ann Arbor, the Detroit Observatory in Ann Arbor also has been restored and is very much as it was mm. originally. And um, so that's another one well worth the visit. Uh, a few years ago, we hired an expert clockmaker. We removed the uh, governor and the mechanical clock drive from the pier, and he took it back to his workshop, completely rebuilt it and fine tuned it. Um, but everything on there is pretty much original, except for the bushings and some of the axles. We, we never had to like reconstruct or rebuild anything. It's all the way it was. Oh, Ken, we need to put together a, a list of, of sites to visit, cross-country list of sites to visit that are historical and astronomical yeah, there, there are some, uh, some resources that list some of that. Um, I mean, the Antique Telescope Society that I'm a member of um, in, in the days before <laughs> um, when, when you could actually meet people in person and go places, um, we would have annual meetings at different observatories, you know, hosted by the different observatories and, uh, you know, use the instruments and that sort of thing. So um, there are quite a few Observatories worth visiting in the country for sure. So, sounds like a sky and telescope or some other type of opportunity to get a group tour going to do some <laughs> do some visiting for sure. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I've I have seen um, from the 1930s. Uh, it was a German group that uh, made a tour of the US uh, to visit various of the observatories uh, like Yerkes, Lake Observatory, um, you know, various uh, major observatories. And it was basically a group of amateurs that wanted to go visit as many observatories as they could. And hmm. not sure how much observing they got to do, but um, it's, it's a, uh, it's a pastime of long standing, I guess, is the way to put it. So, you know, Providence, you, you speak of Providence in the old days, mm -hmm. but Providence has changed a lot in its stature and, and, and its um, influence over the, over the course of time. So maybe you could speak to where she stands today as opposed to maybe 100, 200 years ago. Mm. And... Yeah. Um, so obviously in the aftermath of uh, after the Great Depression, as you start to get into the uh, in between years, World War I to World War II, uh, manufacturing basically collapses in, in, in Rhode Island and specifically Providence. Uh, some of the mill complexes in here employed 5,000, 7,000, 10,000 people. Um, one thing that we, one of the biggest changes is that back in the 1860s or 1870s, you didn't hire adults to work in a mill. They were children, sometimes as young as 12 years old. Uh, Rhode Island was the child labor capital of New England. Um, our economy has shifted to many other things. The population declined for a while. Um, today, there's a lot of high tech, um, a lot of, a lot of um, gourmet restaurants, for example, um, a lot of cultural, things like Trinity Rep Theater Company, uh, the museum that I used to work at, the Children's Museum. Um, yeah, it's kind of hard to compare it. It's changed so much. And of course, you have your own astronomical societies and clubs in the 
Rhode Island or area, you might want to speak to those. Yeah. Uh, so at, during your business meeting, you mentioned the Skyscrapers Astronomical Society of Rhode Island, which is in Situate. Um, just a short drive to the west of uh, Providence. Uh, they do some amazing programs there. They have some nice facilities. Uh, there's the Frosty Drew Observatory in um, Ninegrip Park on the southern coast of Rhode Island. And I don't know if you've heard, but they just installed a 24 inch wave plane. Um, they haven't got it up and running yet, but it should be ready in just a couple of weeks uh, for public observing. Wow. And that's a relatively dark sky site, at least for by Rhode Island standards. Hmm. And Mike? Yeah. This is Bob Napier here. Oh, oh hi. hi, how you doing? Good, how are you? Very good, I didn't realize you were in on this. Well, yeah, I'm a member of the ATMs for a long awesome. time, but I have a yeah. question about that. You mentioned uh, the skyscrapers, uh, and of course we have the uh, 1878 eight inch Clark. Now it moved to Situate in 1914 out of Providence. Mm. Now, when they built the observatory there, there's an ante room to the actual dome construction. Right. But as you step out of the ante room and you walk straight ahead, you walk into a, a cube of cement. It's about uh, two feet high and it has a uh, uh, sort of a, a bar, an iron steel bar uh, embedded in the cement. And what that is for is for a transit instrument. Mm. Now we have a transit telescope and I wonder, I, I have never heard anything about why they had that transit telescope there. Was it in any way connected with timekeeping that you know of? Well, so that observatory served the local community. So this means Providence, Pawtucket, and so on. We wouldn't have had long distance telegraph wires running to someplace like Citra. Um, and so they probably had a local clock that they would have calibrated to do observations like occultation timings, for example. Very important that you have accurate timekeeping for that. Um, Smiley was very interested in eclipses and also um, some of the astronomers at Brown were interested in the transits of Mercury and Venus. Uh, timing of that was very critical. So I assume, I'm, I'm just guessing here, but I would assume that there, the one at Situate was used for a local accurate timepiece just because they didn't have access to the wider infrastructure that was available in a metropolitan area like Providence. Well, I've never seen or heard anything of why that transit instrument or when it was actually built, if it was built at the same time, oh. the grave observatory, or if it was built after Smiley. Smiley, of course, founded skyscrapers. Right. Oh, that's interesting. In 1932. Um, and it, it he acquired. Be, it could be that. Yeah, I can imagine Smiley wanting to have a transit instrument for local timekeeping there. Um, one of the things that LAD did that was research oriented is that you make observations of an asteroid as it transits the meridian. And you do this in numerous locations. So Harvard, Yale, Brown, uh, maybe even Seagrave. And then you can triangulate on where the asteroid is in the solar system and measure an accurate distance to it. And transit telescopes are used for this. Uh, so Smiley may have had an interest in either eclipse observations, um, transits, occultations. Uh, he was fascinated by eclipses and calculating the exact orbit of the moon, like to many decimal places, it might've been, of use to him to have two observatories that were relatively close together, like Seagrave and Vlad. Looks like Kenneth has a question. I was just going to comment um, that 
it's rare to find an observatory in the 19th century or even the first half of the 20th century that didn't have a transit instrument. It was like standard equipment. It was expected you'd have one. And um, if you look at the, the buildings of uh, all over the country, there's usually a transit wing. And um, they may or may not been do, have been doing uh, timekeeping, but one of the things that was very important to the various observatories is figuring out where they were and the exact location you know, longitude and latitude of the observatory was something many of them spent a year or more figuring out using their transit instrument after they started uh, doing uh, work. So it's pretty typical. I'm not at all surprised that Seagrave had one. And I'm guessing, um, you know, that um, he was a wealthy gentleman. He picked the right parents. And because uh, I believe that eight inch Clark telescope was given to him on his 18th birthday, I believe it was, and uh, by doting parents. And Alvin Graham Clark was there to, uh, when they first uh, dedicated it or whatever for a kid. And I'm trying to imagine my 18 year old, uh, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, continuing, he continued the interest uh, legitimately for his entire life and did in fact do a lot of actual, you know, uh, research with it, but, um, but it was, it was a, so I'm not surprised it's there. Um, I believe they still have it, don't they, at Seagrave? Or do you, do you know? Or? The transit or, instrument? Yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, it was loaned to uh, um, sort of a researcher at Sky and Telescope uh, for a while. And then it was brought back. Uh, that was a number of years ago. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the purpose of that loan was. I never saw any results. Um, but uh, yeah, the instrument is still there. Uh, but again, Seagrave was uh, not a professional astronomer, uh, but he may have done at that time professional level work. Uh, I think there was actually an asteroid that uh, he, uh, or maybe it was Halley's Comet in 1910, that he uh, had a lot to do with calculating the orbit uh, of the comet back then. They were, that telescope, the 8-inch Clark, was originally in Providence on Benefit Street, and uh, it was moved in 1914 out to Situate because of the um, pollution of the, mm. uh, I guess, the, uh, the coal lights. dust from furnaces and uh, the gas lights and whatever. But the uh, pollution effect was what prompted the move to Situate, I believe. Yeah, Seagrave uh, actually uh, was, for Halley's Comet, he was the one who predicted, calculated that in fact, the Earth would pass through the tail of Halley's Comet. And um, there was belief that cyanogen, right. you know, poisonous gas, would be you know, in the tail and that we'd be just passing right through it. So there was quite a bit of um, publicity about his observations mm -hmm. um, you know, nationally. So, um, and you know, he did, he did uh, contribute reports at various uh, eclipse expeditions, you know, the Naval Observatory would publish these books of observations by various observers at particular eclipses, and his observations are featured in several of them. So he was a serious amateur. I mean, he uh, at least wasn't just a dilettante or whatever. Um, so. he, was, he was quite an astrometrist, I guess. Uh, a lot to do with measuring a um, the angles of double stars and, uh, of course, the asteroid positions. There was one asteroid, I think it started with an A, that was discovered uh, in the early 1900s. Then it was lost for, I don't know, quite a few years. And he uh, presumably was able to recover it somehow by his calculations. but. Anyway, he was, uh, he, 
he was not a professional in that he didn't earn a living that way, but he certainly did uh, at that time, certainly professional level observations and uh, reporting. Mm -hmm. like Tom has a question and after that I might officially close the meeting but we'll still hang around and talk for a while Tom you have your hand raised do you have a question you're muted Ken, are you suggesting by your question that AppMob is not doing their part in having a transit instrument uh, available and working? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I don't have one um, myself, so I, I can't um, I can't uh, offer one. So, well, if one we just one need to wait for the right benefactor. Yeah, one comes becomes available. I'm sure our next uh, uh, president may be willing to play a role in making sure that we could get that in place. Yeah. It's Have either the uh, pendulum clocks calibrated. I'm the guy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to thank you, Michael, for the presentation and hanging around for the Q&A. I'm going to yeah. present the last slide and officially close the meeting, but we'll all still be here hanging out if you'd like to stay. Sure, sure. Let me see, share screen. Okay, so with that, we'll bring a close to this meeting. Our next meeting will be December 9th at 8 p.m. And we've got a board meeting coming up on January 6th. So thank you all for attending.